It was just before the Passover feast. And Jesus knew. A bit later on it says that Jesus was knowing. Now just consider the words there. That Jesus, in effect, he steps back from the situation that he's about to face. He's about to face the, the, uh, the, the, the final week. Well, the final few days, actually. This is the, the Passover evening. Yeah? And he steps back. Before he deals with the actual situation, he steps back and he looks beyond the situation. If you look there at um, the verses, it says that Jesus knew that the time had come for him to leave this world and go to the Father. Or Jesus knew that his hour had come. That is, he's not first of all focused on the events there, he's looking beyond them. He's looking to God's eternal timetable. He's looking to the fact that the hour, the time has now come. And jumping down, um, in, into verse 3, it says, Jesus knew, or Jesus knowing, that the Father had put all things under his power, and that he had come from God, and he was returning to God. So consider this of what Jesus is standing back now, and he's considering, looking beyond the situation, beyond the table, beyond the meal, beyond the disciples there, beyond the cross, beyond everything. He is standing back, and he is looking at eternity. Now the scholars have called this uh, introduction here in chapter 13 a second prologue, and it's very much like that, isn't it? You've got the prologue at the beginning of John, John chapter 1, yeah? In the beginning was the Word, and, and then off it sets about the eternity, and then into the Gospel. And here we have, if you like, a second prologue, a second time where we, we look at eternity. Jesus looks at eternity. He looks at the fact that he has come from the Father, with whom he was for all eternity past. <coughs> And at some time in eternity past, he was choosing you and me, wasn't he? Choosing those who would be in the Lamb. He, he's, he's focusing then, first of all, on that. Looking at that eternal past and looking that everything that's going to happen now is all in accordance with his plan. You see there it says that uh, the Father had given everything into his hand or everything into his power. That is, I mean, it always was the case, but especially now that everything that is going to happen from this Passover meal and beyond is all exactly in the hand of God, exactly in the power of God. Knowing that the Father has given all things into his hands. And sandwiched between those two verses, where it talks about Jesus knowing, you also have the mention of the devil there. That the devil uh, has um, <laughs> already prompted Judas Iscariot. And that again is looking at that eternal truth, the eternal conflict. And this is the moment now, the final few days of Jesus' earthly life, when the devil will be conquered on the cross. Jesus looks at what will come. The betrayal, the flogging, the crucifixion, death itself. He looks at those, but he looks beyond them. Like a marathon runner about to start his 26 miles of agony. He looks beyond the 26 miles, doesn't he? He looks to the finishing podium. He looks to a personal best time. He looks to the result of all his training. Or imagine somebody about to start a 10-hour shift at a factory. And all the drudgery in the factory. And they're looking beyond that. They're looking to that day when they've saved enough money not to be at the factory anymore. There are many occasions when you and I look beyond the situation itself. In our Christian walk, again and again and again, we are called to look beyond 
the daily trials, the daily struggles, the daily temptations, to look beyond that, to look to the fact that your name is written in heaven through faith in Jesus Christ, to look to the fact that you were called in the Lamb before the creation of the world. If you think, for instance, how do I deal with the situation that some of our relatives are suffering war, that we are here as refugees? How do you deal with the situation that I've got a load of bills coming in the mail? How do I deal with the situation that I've got a letter from the doctor that doesn't say nice things? How do I deal with a situation when I'm on the hospital bed being wheeled down the corridor? That time and time again we have to stand back and we have to look beyond the situation. And look to the fact that we are called in Jesus Christ. And he will give me the strength for whatever is today. We see the bigger picture. And when we look at the Passover room with the disciples there, together with Jesus, we are looking beyond that and looking to the bigger picture. But very interesting here, Jesus isn't just with his head in the clouds, as it were, looking beyond. What is the very first thing that he does, having considered eternity, the very first thing? He takes the form of a servant. Now isn't that combination wonderful? Head is in the clouds, so to speak, but his feet are on the ground. Even though he knows his eternal destiny, the Lord of Lords and King of Kings, there he is with his feet on the ground and he loves and he serves his disciples. And that, that putting uh, the, 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 the towel around his waist, very much symbolic of a servant, uh, there's a Jewish commentary, which is called a Midrash, which you may have heard of. And the Midrash does commentary of the Old Testament. And you know the Old Testament bit where um, Abraham sends off uh, Hagar? Yeah? Because Sarah's a bit jealous, so Hagar gets sent off. Well, when Hagar gets sent off, in the Midrash it says that Abraham got a, 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 a towel and tied it round Hagar's waist so that everybody who meets Hagar would know that she is a servant very much in the mindset there. So, I mean, if you go into a restaurant and someone's got a towel over their, over their forearm like that, you conclude they are waiter. the waiter. That's, yeah? Very symbolic there. The, the towel around the waist, that symbol of a servant. And then, uh, as we considered earlier, he loved his disciples, he showed his love for them, and, and very much characterised in that serving them. Though he was their master, he became their servant. How absolutely amazing. And we see there a, a, a great example for us, don't we? That on the one hand, we look to the heavens and we face the different problems in this world by looking beyond this world to eternity. But on the other hand, our feet are on the ground serving one another in Jesus Christ. Jesus looked beyond. Another character in this story. It is amazing to think and we consider the feet that Jesus, that Jesus washed that among those feet, there was a pair of feet that had walked to the Sanhedrin. There is a pair of feet that had already led themselves before the Sanhedrin and said, what will you give me that I will be trusted? Imagine Jesus then washing the feet of Judas, knowing that Judas would betray him. <coughs> According to uh, Luke's Gospel, Judas was there at the, what we call the communion. Judas had had the bread and wine. Judas had had his feet washed. Why did 
Judas sin? What is the root of that? What is the root of sin, if you think about it? <coughs> I suppose there's a few answers we could give to that. But Jesus, we say, is looking beyond the current world. Judas had stopped doing that. For him, the focus was this world. We read in John's Gospel, John chapter 12, that Judas was the keeper of the bag and he had started to help himself from the bag. How do you start to sin? How do you start to steal from the bag? Surely it starts at that moment when you are no longer looking beyond to eternity, but your thoughts are now on the here and now. There is no eternity, there is no future, so I'll help myself from the back. There is no comeuppance. If you think of sin, generally, sin is where we no longer think that there is going to be anything after this life. <coughs> Eat, drink and be merry, for be tomorrow we die. Adultery. Oh, there's no tomorrow, there's no eternal judgment for that. Theft, there's no eternal judgment for that. Or even murder. People do things because they think they will get away with them. So we see that contrast. Jesus always remaining pure and holy, but always focusing on eternity. And Judas Iscariot had lost his focus on eternity. He had started to focus on the here and now. And that led him then into stealing. <coughs> it is amazing the love that Jesus showed to Judas to the end. Okay, Judas made another choice. But Jesus, as we said, had given him communion. He would washed his feet. And then they're sitting round the table. Um, now we read, let, let's just have a, have, a, have a look at those, those verses. If, um, verse 21, I think it is. End of verse 21, um, Jesus says, uh, one of you is going to betray me. His disciples stared at one another at a loss to know which of them he meant. One of them, the disciple whom Jesus loved, was reclining next to him. And Simon Peter mentioned to this disciple and said, ask him which one he means. And leaning back against Jesus, he asked him, Lord, who is it? And Jesus answered, it is the one to whom I give this piece of bread when I dipped it into the dish. And then dipping the piece of bread, he gave it to Judas Iscariot, son of Simon. As soon as Judas took the bread, Satan entered into him. What you're about to do, do quickly, Jesus told him. But no one at the meal understood why Jesus had said this to him. Since Judas was in charge of the money, some thought he was telling him to buy what he needed for the feast or give something to the poor. <coughs> as soon as Judas had taken the bread, he went out and it was night. The situation here, you have to imagine the layout of the room that they would have had for the Passover meal, which actually wasn't the Jewish layout for a meal, they'd, they'd, they'd adopted more a Gentile layout for meals. And you had then a table in the middle, a low table, like a sort of our coffee table, with the, all the foods on that. And then arranged on three sides of that, you'd have couches on which the people sort of lay on the one shoulder, uh, or elbow, or just as a by the way, most people are right-handed, yeah? Did you know that your stomach is designed in such a way that it empties quicker if you sleep on your left-hand side? If you are eating, propped up on your left elbow, and eating with your right hand, it's bad for us left-handed people, but the right-handed people, if you're eating with your right hand, you're going, it is being digested quicker. So I would ask all the evolutionists to go and work that one out, but that's just to buy the way. <laughs> are supremely created by God. So anyway, the, the layout then, they're lying there on the tables, their elbows like this, their right hand is free. It seems then that John is the disciple on this side, 
and to speak to Jesus privately when, when um, Peter says, go and ask him what he means, who's he going to betray you? He's leaning backwards onto Jesus. And that lovely picture there that he's on Jesus' breast. And that marries up with the fact that in the prologue, we have that Jesus is on the breast of the Father. And now we have John, who is writing the Gospel, is on the breast of Jesus. That sort of uh, link li li there. But he's leaning back. And it's then just a private conversation. And it seems when you read the Gospels that the other disciples don't quite hear everything, because they don't quite understand why Jesus, and Judas gets off and, and goes at that point. But Jude, Jesus then, he's the host at the middle table. John on this side, and then the three like couches, one here, one there, one there, table in the middle. Yeah. Jesus then does something. He gets the bread, and he dips it into the sauce, or whatever is there, and he offers it then to Judas. Now this may seem an insignificant act to us, it's just the way he indicated who it was, but actually in that setting, with Jesus as the host of the meal, he's actually giving Judas an honour at that point. You think if you're at a meal, and the host is carving up the chicken or whatever, and they say to you, do you want the piece of the breast, the best piece of chicken? They, you are honouring the guest, aren't you? And Jesus, in, in dipping in the bread and giving that tidbit to Judas, is actually giving him a one final indicator of his love. Even at that very late point, Judas could have still repented. <coughs> yes, Satan had entered into him, but he's still in control of himself. Hands up, who knows the Holy Spirit is in them? Are you still in control of yourself? Have you ever ignored the Holy Spirit when the Holy Spirit was telling you to do something? Yeah? The Bible says that the spirits of the prophets are subject to the prophets. So Satan's gone into Judas when he takes the bread. He is still, though, able to decide. And Jesus gives him one last, come on, make up your mind. What you have to do, go and do quickly. But at that moment then, Judas makes the fateful decision. He goes out. He wasn't sent out. He wasn't kicked out. He's got his own free will. He took the breath. He went out. And John supremely writes there, and it was night. Interesting because it would have been the Passover. So the Passover means you've got a full moon. So it's not completely pitch black out there, yet for Judas it was. Because he had failed to look beyond this world. He had failed to look beyond. And he entered into sin. This is, a, this is a great lesson for us, great in the sort of big lesson, not a good lesson. It's a great lesson for us to consider all that Judas had and yet he still fell. Three years teaching with, you, with Jesus, received communion, seen miracles, had his feet washed, yet he still fell. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, let him who stands <coughs> take care. Bless the Lord. Just that, that, that encouragement for us all the time to be aware. The Bible says the devil is like a prowling lion wandering around to see whom he can devour. Now, the Bible is a wonderful book, isn't it? There are, there are scriptures there which talk of absolute security in God. Yeah? No one can snatch them out of my Father's hand. And yet there are other scriptures which talk of our part. Let him who thinks he stands take care. And those two come together, don't they? And finally, just with, 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 with Judas there, as I say, he could have repented, he could have sought God and found forgiveness. As long as breath is in a person, they can still come to God and find forgiveness. Even then. Who's met somebody who's given you that line, oh God couldn't forgive me? Yeah? 
They're there, they're wallowing in the drink or whatever it may be. Oh, you don't know what I've done. God couldn't forgive me. We need to speak against that lie. And we need to say, uh-uh. Whatever you have done, God can forgive. Amen. There's a contrast. Moving on to Peter. Judas and Peter are very different. You see, Judas, in his sin, he is revealing what is in his heart. Peter's heart is different. Peter said three times later on, didn't he, at the end of the Gospel, that you know, Lord, I love you. Peter loved the Lord Jesus Christ. His sin was, was one of those things where it's the weakness of the hu human nature. There is the pressure. There is the pointing finger, weren't you, with him? You're one of his disciples. And under the pressure, under the heat of the moment, he fell. Who sinned like that? Yeah? Under the heat of the moment, with the pointing finger, you bottled it. And yet you love the Lord Jesus Christ, and afterwards you come back to him for forgiveness. Judas wasn't in that situation. He wasn't under the pointing finger. He was sitting there under a candlelit dinner with perfect free choice. And yet he chose evil and, as I said, neglected to come back to God for forgiveness. So let's move to Peter. So Jesus looked beyond the situation. Judas didn't look beyond the situation. And then we come to Peter. Oh, Peter was looking beyond, wasn't he? He was desiring to be in God's dwelling place, as we've so. Yeah. He was there. He was saying, oh Lord, I will lay down my life for your sake. He'd already in his mind's eye booked his place at the table. I'm going to be a martyr for Jesus. I'm going to be there. I'll lay down my life. I'll serve you till the end. He was definitely looking beyond this current world. He desired heaven. Oh, sometimes we desire heaven, don't we? Well, hopefully always. But there are those times when life just seems too hard, too difficult. So, oh, dear Lord, if you could just take me now. If I could just be in paradise with you now, instead of with this body, with these illnesses, or instead of with all these different problems. Sometimes when a loved one dies, and the door opens just wide enough for them to go through. And we're left. And we say, oh dear Lord, if only you could have taken me as well. But now I'm left alone. We desire to leave. We desire the heavenly kingdom which is already in our hearts. But Jesus speaks to Peter. Peter says, Lord, why can't I follow you now? So the other way around, look at that. Peter says, Lord, where are you going? This is verse 36. And Jesus says, where I am going, you cannot follow now, but you will follow later. Verse 37, Peter asks, Lord, why can't I follow you now? I will lay down my life for you. As I say, he's looking to that eternal future. And Jesus answered, Will you really lay down your life for me? I tell you the truth before the cock crows, you will deny me three times. Peter thought he was ready, didn't he? He thought he'd completed the discipleship training course. He was, he was there, he could go. <coughs> but Jesus was like, no, 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 no. Not so fast, not yet. Peter still has work to do. He still has to preach at Pentecost. He still has to baptise Cornelius to raise Talitha. He still has to do a few miracles. He still has to write two letters. That first letter he writes is much about persecution. He still had, first of all, to suffer flogging, Acts chapter 5. He had to suffer imprisonment, Acts chapter 12. 
He had to suffer these things so that he was later then able to write, Dear friends, do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal you're going through as though something strange is happening to you. And he tells them, guess what? If you desire to live a holy life in this world, you will be persecuted, you will suffer. And he's able to write these things out of his own experience. Jesus is telling Peter, you're not going to heaven just yet. You still have work to do. And that applies to us, doesn't it? There is that desire to be heavenward bound. And yet God says to us, you still have work to do. And most importantly, Peter, there was still work to do on himself. Not just what he was going to do for others, preaching and teaching and writing letters, but what was going to happen to Peter? Well, there was that pride that's going to have to be dealt with, it wasn't there? Peter, it's not going to be through your martyrdom. You need to wait. You need to see the cross. You need to see me hanging there. You need to see me being taken down. You need to see me being buried. You need to see these things and know that it is through the cross, through my death, and then through my resurrection, that the door for heaven is open. Peter, you need to see these things. It is not through your greatness, Peter, through your laying down your life, but it is through me laying down my life. Peter has to see these things. His little vessel, as it were, was not yet kitted out to sail into eternity. He needed to learn humility. <clears throat> he needed to learn that the salvation is totally done by Jesus. He needed to learn patience. He needed to learn the fruits of the Spirit. He needed to learn self-control and whatever else it is. He was later in one of his letters to quote where it says, Psalm, sorry, Proverbs 3, 34, God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. And he had to learn that first, that humbling himself before God. And we can put ourselves in Peter's sandals, can't we? And think, why am I still here, Lord? But on the one side, there's all the things that God still wants you to do for him. And then there also is the work that God still wants to do in you. Whatever your particular uh, Achilles heel is, so to speak. Whether it's pride or anger or doubt or selfishness or whatever it is. That the Lord wants to work his work in you. <coughs> Heaven is desired by Peter, but heaven is delayed, but also heaven is definite. He says to him, you will follow after me. And that's in two senses, isn't it? There's the sense that just as Jesus died, was crucified, yeah, so too Peter would follow that same path. Tradition has it that uh, he also suffered a, a, a martyr's death. There is that way that he would follow. But also, just as Jesus' story didn't end there, that Jesus was resurrected and Jesus goes into eternal glory in heaven, so too for Peter. You will follow me. That is an assurance for Peter. That as I lead you, you will follow me not only into persecution, but you will follow me into glory. It says, doesn't it, in Hebrews, that for the joy set before him, Jesus endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Jesus looked beyond this world to the world beyond. <laughs> but at the same time, he served the disciples. Judas failed to look beyond this world and just lined his pockets and went out into the darkness. 
Peter was looking beyond this world, but the Lord said, wait a minute, <coughs> time is not yet come. You're going to need to be humbled, you will deny me, you will follow me, you will follow me into eternal glory. And that, I hope, is a message for all of us today. Let us pray.